Welcome back again, in Anime Galaxy. Today I brought you the best anime, in summer 2024, I parry everything. The story kicks off in the Clay's kingdom up in the northwest. We meet our main dude Nor, who's whipping up some medicine for his sick mom. His mom drinks that stuff, and she's grateful, giving props to Nor for always holding her down. Nor tells her he's gonna go feed the sheep real quick, and his mom asks him to swear he won't step outside the barrier. He does so and says that he'll bring back some fruits and rabbit meat to make soup. But then his mama starts coughing like crazy, and Nor gets all worried. He tells her he'll boil some water for her, but his mama stops him. She wipes off the dirt from her hard-working son's face, and with a heavy heart, she apologizes for not being able to give him much. She tells him he deserves to choose his own path in life. Next, we see Noor whipping up that soup at night with the rabbit meat and fruits he gathered. When it's ready, he takes it to his mama. He tries to wake her up, but she ain't responding. It hits him hard to find out she's gone. So he digs a grave for his mom right next to his dad's resting place, and he cries silently. After that, Nor spends his time hunting for food, taking care of his cattle, keeping his house in order, and reading some books. Every day passes with him sticking to these routines, and he feels hella lonely when he ain't busy. One day, he comes across an old book in his house. As he reads it, he remembers it's the same book his dad used to read to him back in the day. His dad used to tell him about adventurers, how they could break curses in creepy forests, study magic to become badass wizards, team up to take down massive monsters, and even score an all-curing elixir from the Spirit King. No matter what kind of crisis they faced, they fought to protect the weak, their crew, and straight up obliterate evil. That got Nor all hyped, and he kept bugging his dad for more stories about them. Back in the present, Nor remembers his mom telling him to decide how he wants to live his life. So he starts thinking about becoming an adventurer. The next day, he lays out a ton of feed for his cattle, says his goodbyes to his mom and dad, and lets them know he's heading to the city on his first trip to become an adventurer. With a bit of hesitation, he steps outside the barrier around his house. After days of traveling all alone, he finally makes it to the city. He enters the city and asks the gate guards for directions to the guild, and they point him in the right direction. Once he's in the city, he's all wide-eyed like a country bumpkin seeing crazy new stuff for the first time, and everything gets him hyped. He heads over to the adventurer's guild, but the guild master tries to brush him off, saying it ain't no place for kids, but Nor ain't having it. He tells the guild master that the gatekeeper sent him here because he wants to become an adventurer. The guild master tries to talk some sense into him, saying he's making a dumb decision and his parents would be worried sick. But Nor drops the bomb that both his parents are already dead. When asked for his name, he introduces himself. The guild master mentions that Nor should start by going to the training school if he wants to be an adventurer, but he warns him that it might be tough since they never had a candidate as young as him. Nor asks what the training school is all about, and the guild master explains that everyone who wants to join the Royal Capitals Adventurers Guild gotta pick a training school. He'll have to choose his adventurer class there and train up, learning all sorts of useful skills to be a real adventurer. Now Nor being a country bumpkin, has no clue about skills. The guild master breaks it down, saying they talking about sword techniques, magic, and all that kind of stuff. This gets Nor all hyped and the scene switches to him at a swordsman training school. He's thinking he gonna be like some hero who can take down a dragon the size of a freaking mountain with one swing. He starts training in swordsmanship, and one by one, the other students start unlocking some sick sword skills. Nor keeps training, but he's low-key jealous watching them. Fast forward a few months, and we see everyone else making progress, but Nor's still struggling. He keeps training, but his instructor tells him to quit. But Nor wants to keep training more, but the instructor shuts him down, saying he'd just be wasting his time. According to the instructor, Nor's a talentless loser who's only learned how to parry. He straight up tells Nor to find another path, and suggests checking out the other training schools to unlock his potential. So Nor decides to give the warrior school a shot, thinking it's cool because he can be on the front lines protecting his crew. He goes through some hardcore training there, but still, he ain't making any progress. After training for several months, his instructor straight up tells him to bounce, because all he managed to do was buff himself up a bit with physical enhancement. The instructor warns him that he gonna end up dead if he keeps pushing down this path. So Nor decides to give the hunter training school a shot, but he fails there too. The instructor straight up tells him he ain't cut out for delicate tools like bows. Nor ain't letting that stop him though. He tries his luck at the magician training school next. But even after all that training, all he can do is cast a weak flame that can barely light a freaking candle. He ain't done yet though Nor heads to the thieves training school. But no matter how hard he tries, he can't get the hang of disarming traps, picking locks, or detecting presences, so he's gotta quit that too. It's one fail after another. Finally, Nor gives the cleric training school a shot, but no luck there either. After months of training, all he can do is a basic healing spell that can treat some scrapes. He then heads back disappointed to the guild, 
and the guildmaster is shocked to learn that he couldn't learn a single damn thing even after all that training. The guildmaster straight up tells him he ain't got what it takes to be an adventurer. So this talentless loser leaves the city in disappointment, heading back to his house. He tells his parents that he ain't got no talent for adventuring, but he ain't giving up. He's determined to try harder than anyone else. He crafts himself a wooden sword, remembering what his sword instructor told him about his one skill potentially turning into something else if he keeps honing it. So he focuses on his parry skill, training day and night, dedicating his life to it. A year passes by, and we find out Norse trained his parry skill to deflect 10 swords at once, he ain't developed any new skills yet, but he feels like he's moving forward. Three more years pass, and now he can parry a hundred swords at once, but still no new skills, but our boy ain't giving in. He keeps training non-stop breaking his sword in the process, and healing his scratches with his weak healing skill. Fast forward 10 more years, and now Nor can parry a thousand swords at once. He realizes he hasn't missed a single day of training in the past 14 years, but he still ain't learned a damn new skill yet. The next day, Nor decides to hit up the city once again, and the scene cuts to him at the Adventurer's Guild. The guild staff checks out his skills, parry, physical enhancement, stone throw, feather step, tiny flame, and low heel. She wonders if he's really sure about registering with these weak-ass skills. She starts talking about the training school system and how it can level up his skills, but Nor says that he already studied under all of them already. This puts the girl on the spot, and she don't know what to say. Nor peeps the situation and realizes he ain't gonna be able to join the guild. He wonders if there's truly no way for him to get in. Then the guild master rolls up, and he has a hard time recognizing the grown-up Nor. But after a good look, he figures it out. Nor spills about what he's been up to all this time, and the guild master can't believe that after all that training, all Nor got is a slightly stronger parry. The guild master breaks it down for Nor, saying adventurers are ranked from S, the strongest, to E, the weakest. To register as an E-ranked adventurer, you gotta have at least one useful skill. But Nor doesn't even got that. Nor starts thinking it might be time to give up on his dream if that's the case, but the guild master tells him it ain't completely hopeless yet. He mentions there's a legendary rank below E, that not many people know about. Nor gets all hyped because he can join as an F-ranked adventurer, but the guild master lays down some conditions. He says Nor won't be able to take no hunting or gathering jobs outside the city. He'll only be able to do odd jobs within the city's limits. He thinks Nor might not be down for it since it's meant for beggars to put food on the table, but Nor agrees to join the guild as an F-ranked adventurer anyway. The guild master is hella surprised, but he registers Nor when he insists. Nor is stoked to get his adventurer card and starts taking on odd jobs around the city. He completes them one by one, using his weak-ass skills, and keeps up his sword training on the side. Days are flying by as Nor keeps lending a hand to people all over the city. One day, he's chilling by a fire, and it hits him, he's finally living his dream, becoming an adventurer who helps others. He knows his skill set ain't gonna get him much more, so he keeps hustling odd jobs around the city. One day, he steps up to help an old lady clean her nasty drains, and she's all grateful for his constant help. Then he lands a job at a construction site, and when he wraps up work, he spots a glow coming from a cave, along with cries for help. Nor bolts to the cave as fast as he can and sees a freaking minotaur about to take out a girl. Turns out she got some knights trying to protect her, but damn they stand no chance against that gigantic beast. The monster wipes out the captain of the knights with a single blow, then proceeds to massacre the others like squishing bugs. Blood's flooding the whole area, and the girl's straight up horrified. The minotaur sets its sights on the girl, but Nor uses his rock throw skill to divert the monster's attention to himself. The minotaur starts chasing Nor, lunges at him, but he manages to parry its attack. The minotaur keeps coming at him, and Nor keeps parrying every damn attack. But with each move, his sword takes a beating. Nor knows he needs to find an opening, but he also knows he ain't got the offensive skills to take down the minotaur, even if he finds one. He notices the girl still there, and when the minotaur tries to attack her again, he busts out his feather step skill and rushes in to save her, wrecking his sword in the process. He figures, even if he can't be the top tier adventurer, he's gotta hold it down for the girl right in front of him. He recalls his old man's words about the true meaning of being an adventurer. The minotaur swings at him once more, but Nor parries like a boss. This time, the minotaur's axe slips from its hands, and boom, the axe beheads the monster. Nor realizes if the fight had gone on any longer, he'd be six feet under, so it hits him again how much talent he lacks. The girl thanks him for saving her life and asks for his name, but Nor says he ain't worth remembering and bounces. Some knights show up to rescue the girl, and we see Nor back in town. He can't believe he almost got taken out by a random cow roaming in the streets, and he's dead set on training even harder. A while later, a cleanup crew rolls up to move the minotaur's ass out of there, 
along with all the folks who died trying to fight it. And Princess Lin feels hella guilty about all the deaths. Right then, her knight ends comes rushing up and apologizes for not sticking by her side when she went into the damn dungeon because it's her job to protect Lin. But Lin tells her it ain't her damn fault. This was just some basic ass trial for the throne succession. So it wouldn't make sense to force her knight to tag along. Just then another knight tells Lin they gonna head back to the castle soon because Lord Rain wanna have a chat with her and she already knows what that shit gonna be about. Back at the castle, Lord Rain just finished talking to Lin trying to understand what the hell happened, but none of it making sense to him. The only way a minotaur could end up in that part of the dungeon is if someone straight up summoned it with magic, and the knight agrees with that assumption. He thinks the whole incident got something to do with a merchant found dead at the scene with a ring, and when they checked it out, they realized the damn magic stone in the ring got a crazy high level of purity something you don't normally see on the market. A minotaur ain't no joke, it's an A-level demon. So no random rich dude could just buy something that can control one. Plus, the crest on the ring suggests it came from the magical empire of Derrida's. So Rain think the Derrida's people are behind this shit because they always had beef with him. But even then, the fact that they straight up tried to assassinate Lin and didn't even bother getting rid of the evidence, it gotta mean they trying to bait Rain into starting a war so they can take over the damn dungeon. Aside from that, Rain also gotta think about the guide who saved Lin. According to the reports, dude managed to whoop the Minotaur's ass in seconds with just a broken sword. And on top of that, the castle spies tried to tail him when he was leaving, but the dude straight up vanished right before their damn eyes. Rain can't believe what the hell he's hearing, so he is hella curious about finding out who this mysterious warrior is. Meanwhile, Nor just rolled back into the damn guild, and the guild master looking hella surprised because he thought Nor got himself killed. He heard about a demon popping up in the dungeon, and that shit was right next to the construction site where Nor was working, so he figured Nor must have bit the dust. Nor apologizes for causing worry and explains that he had some shady folks tailing him last night so he had to shake them off and went home without reporting what happened. The guildmaster saying Nor is lucky to be alive because a minotaur is a damn demon so strong that even an A-rank adventurer would get insta-killed if they had to face it. Nor is still clueless about the fact that the guildmaster talking about the same damn creature he slayed. So he asks what happened to this demon, and the guildmaster tells him some mysterious dude took it down. Nor still ain't connecting the dots and just goes on with reporting the jobs he finished today. The guildmaster hands over his payment but reminds Nor he is better off getting a regular ass job because he'd make more dough that way. But Nor doesn't give a damn about the money, long as he gets to be an adventurer. Right then, Lin sneaks up behind Nor and says she is damn glad she finally found him. She apologizes for invading his privacy, but she really wanted to meet him again so she used her long-distance detection skill to track him down. Nor assuming she must be some thief-class adventurer if she got a detection skill. But Lin says she actually a magician, she just has skills in all kinds of classes, even if they are basic. The guildmaster and the other folks in the guild start recognizing Lin, so she asks if she and Nor can talk outside. But before they can leave, the guildmaster grabs Nor and asks what the hell he did to make Lin want to talk to him. Nor says he ain't done no illegal shit, meaning he ain't in no damn trouble. So the guildmaster tells him to go with Lin and make sure he don't do nothing stupid. Outside, Lin uses one of her skills to cloak herself and Nor so nobody can see them. And once they find a secluded spot, Lin apologizes again for intruding on Nor, knowing a dude with his power probably got a lot on his plate. Nor says it's all good, and Lin starts off by thanking him once again for what he did because not only did he save her life, but he also saved a whole bunch of people in the nation. Nor ain't thinking he deserves all that hype because all he did was take down a damn cow. Hell, he's pretty damn sure Lin could have handled it on her own if he hadn't shown up. No clue how he came to that conclusion when he saw that same cow slaughtering a bunch of knights. So Lin tries to make him understand that she would have been six feet under if he hadn't come to rescue her. Nor still ain't think he did much to help her, but he accepts her thanks. But then Lin talks about offering him a reward to show her gratitude for his help, nor straight up tells her that a simple thank you is all he needs, so she doesn't gotta give him nothing else. Lin keeps insisting on giving Nor a reward, and now her old man wanna meet him too. But Nor deadass don't want any damn reward. Lin tries one more time to get him to accept, but Nor standing his ground with his no reward policy. Lin getting desperate, asking if there's anything she can do for him or if she can even get him his own territory. But Nor just says he doesn't want none of it. Lin starts crying and telling Nor he gotta accept her gratitude, and she ain't moving from this spot till Nor says he'll accept something from her. Nor remembers a time when he pulled this same tantrum move to get a cleric to train him. And because he doesn't want Lin standing here for hours, he ends up agreeing to meet her old man, but he still doesn't want no fancy ass gifts. Lin is happy as hell to hear that, so she says Nor should stick close to her and she'll use her concealment skills to make sure nobody spots them. Eventually, Nor brought to Lin's house. And as he gets let inside, Lin asks for his name, 
which Nora is happy to provide. But Nora is still clueless about who Lin is, so she apologizes for being rude and straight up introduces herself as Lindbergh Clays. But damn that name is way too damn long, so she usually goes by Lin. Once Nor peeps this house, he finally get why Lin wasn't kidding about being wealthy. It all makes sense why the guild master was sweating bullets about him making a fool of himself. While they strolling, they bump into Inns, and Lin is hella happy to see her. So she runs over and asks where her old man is. Inns tells her he is in a meeting with Rain right now, so he is a little busy. But aside from that, she is curious about the dude standing over there. Lin explains that Nora is the one who saved her life, so Inns says she'll lead them to Lin's dad. Nora ain't never heard of a royal knight, so he figures Inns must be some kinda homemade knight. One of the folks who loves rocking armor for some weird reason. He also notices that Inns ain't too fond of him but he got no clue why. While they strolling, they come across this dude chilling by the window. Soon as he spots them, he gets up and asks what Inns up to and who the hell this random guy is. Inns tells Gilbert to put his damn spear away because Nor is Lin's guest, and it ain't cool to be pointing weapons at guests. Gilbert catches on that Nor must be the dude who saved Lin's life, so he lowers his weapon. Inns asks him to join them in the room because she could use all the support. Gilbert already got a bad vibe about Nor, and Nor can sense that things ain't looking too good for him at this rate, but he keeps on walking. In the throne room, the king is in the middle of a meeting with Rain, and he is hella pissed because it's clear that Deridas doesn't give a damn about honoring their peace treaty. Rain been expecting this shit ever since the last meeting with the king of Deridas, when he straight up demanded they hand over the rights to the dungeon. Obviously the demand got rejected but ever since then, the king of Deridas has been plotting their downfall. Right then, Lin and the crew show up in the throne room, and Lin is all hyped up and goes over to greet her brother and dad. Inns and Gilbert kneel to show respect for the king, but Nor just keeps on walking. Rain notices that Lin wearing that disguise cloak, meaning she must have snuck out without permission. But she says she had no other way to find the man who saved her. The king realizes she talking about Nor, and Nor apologizes for showing up looking all messy, but Lin insists on coming here as soon as possible. He also mentions he ain't no fancy aristocrat or nothing, so he ain't familiar with all the proper etiquette for these kind of situations, so he might accidentally say something rude. But the king tells him it's all good because it's easier to speak without worrying about etiquette. The king reaches out his hand to Nor and formally thanks him for saving Lin's life. Nor brushes it off, saying it ain't no biggie, so a simple thank you is plenty. But the king ain't letting Nor off the hook without a proper reward. He tells Nor he can ask for any amount of cash or land he wants, but Nor still doesn't want nothing. The king is taken aback, but he ups the ante by offering Nor half of all the treasures they snagged from the dungeon. Rain thinks a reward like that is hella too much to be given to just one dude, but Nor still ain't feeling it though. The king doesn't know what the hell to give Nor because he keeps shooting down everything, so he goes over to his throne and grabs the sword hanging on it as a gift for Nor. Rain doesn't think it's a dope idea to give away such a valuable sword, but the king says it's cool because he never uses it anymore, and ain't nobody gonna find out as long as he swaps it with a fake. He hands it to Nor, and as soon as it's in Nor's hand, he can feel how damn heavy it is. From Rain's reaction, Nor can tell that this sword is worth mad bucks, and he ain't down to accept no extravagant gifts. But the king says it's just something he picked up back in his adventuring days, so it's all good for Nor to take it. Nor agrees, so the king asks him to give it a test swing. Nor goes along with it and swings the sword in the air, unleashing a crazy amount of force and surprising everyone around. The king props Nor up for swinging the sword with just one hand, but he's got a request too. He wants Nor to help train Lin on how to be an adventurer. But Nor says there ain't nothing he could possibly teach someone as talented as Lin, and besides, Nor thinks Lin should be the one to decide something like that for herself. After that, Nor figures it's time for him to leave, and as he's leaving, he realizes something special about his sword. It's the perfect shape to fit in the gutters he usually cleans, so he's gonna give it a try tomorrow morning. Before he bounces, Inns rolls up on him and says she wants to chat. First off, she apologizes for her rude behavior earlier, because it was completely uncalled for. But Nor says he doesn't mind at all. Her job is to protect the Clay's family no matter what, so she's hella grateful to Nor for saving Lin's life. And to show her appreciation, she promises to have Nor's back if he ever needs help. Nor doesn't want to go back and forth about this, so he just accepts her offer and says he'll hit her up if he ever needs anything. On another note, Inns also warns Nor that he better not talk to the king so casually again, because even if the king let it slide this time, she ain't gonna let that disrespect fly next time. Nor says he gets it, so Inns in a good mood and asks him for his name. When she hears his name is Nor, she seems hella shocked. Nor asks if he did something wrong again, but Inns says it's nothing and leaves. Nor is about to leave too, but he gets stopped by Gilbert, who wants to throw down and challenge him to a fight. Gilbert's leading Nor through some hallway, 
and Nora's wondering where the heck they going because he just wanna go back to work. But to his surprise, Gilbert brings him to a training arena for a mock duel between them. That shocks Nor because he ain't sparred with nobody since his training school days. Gilbert grabs this wooden pole for practice and spills that he's hella famous in the capital, then asks Nor to choose his weapon too. Nor sees this as a sick chance to learn from a vet, so he chooses a regular wooden sword. He knows he ain't gonna be much of a match for Gilbert, but he's still gonna give it his all. Gilbert makes the first move, thrusting his staff at Nor, but Nor dodges that shit with ease. He can see how smooth and efficient Gilbert's moves are, showing off all that training he's done. But for some reason, it looks like Gilbert's moving in slow motion to Nor. He figures Gilbert's just holding back his strength because he's a noob like him. Nor calls a timeout and tells Gilbert to quit holding back so damn much. So Gilbert decides to get serious with him. He steps up the intensity, but it ain't fast enough to overwhelm Nor. Every time Gilbert misses an attack, Nor finds openings in his defense. On the flip side, Gilbert's getting frustrated because he can't land a hit on Nor, so he pulls out this complex attack, changing his trajectory at the last second, trying to catch Nor off guard. He forces Nor to jump and plans to strike him down as soon as he lands, but damn Nor dodges that attack too. He tells Gilbert to step up the pace because he's feeling comfy with the current intensity. That stings Gilbert's ego because he was already going all out. Nor starts realizing he might actually be stronger than Gilbert, but out of nowhere, the elite guard busts out his special move and aims it at Nor. The attack comes dangerously close, but when the dust settles, Nor ain't standing in front of Gilbert anymore. He dodged that shit and moved to the side. But after seeing the destruction from Gilbert's attack, Nor says he ain't down to fight no more. Nor bounces out of the palace with that, but his mad skills got the other knights buzzing. They can't believe he dodged their captain's special attack. Some of them think Nor only survived because Gilbert was using a practice spear. Otherwise, they believe a genius like him could defeat anyone he wants. Hearing the words takes depressed Gilbert on a trip down memory lane. Dude always had mad talent with a spear and traveled all over the kingdom, battling powerful peeps and taking them down. Ain't nobody who could even come close to challenging him, and that shit got him bored as hell. So he rolls up to the capital and joins the knights, hoping to fight monsters because they're stronger than humans. But even monsters ain't no match for his strength and skill, and the boredom keeps eating at him. Then one day, while he's chilling like a villain, the master of the sword school shows up. This dude was the one who trained Gilbert back in the early days. Gilbert rants about how boring it is to be so damn strong and wishes there were more peeps as strong as the master so he could have some fun fights. The master just tells him that one day, one of his students will rise above him, and Gilbert hopes that shit happens while he's still alive because that might be the only way to cure his boredom. Now, as Gilbert thinks about the dude who one hit killed the Minotaur, his mind's all over the place. From the get-go, he knew Nor was an interesting cat, but he couldn't sense anything remarkable about his strength. But when they sparred, he realized Nor was way stronger than he appeared. When Nor tells him to kick it up a notch, Gilbert busts out his special attack, faster than the speed of sound, knowing full well no human could survive that shit. But Nor dodges the attack, and Gilbert feels straight up defeated. And on top of that, Nor ends the fight right there. Gilbert thinks Nor did it to save him from embarrassing himself in front of the troops. And before bouncing, Nor tells him he's looking forward to their next meetup, which is Nor's way of saying get stronger. Now, Gilbert thinks he finally found someone who can make his life a bit more fun. On the other hand, Nor has no clue how high Gilbert is praising him. He used his body strengthening and feather step skills to dodge Gilbert's ultimate attack at the last damn moment. If he was even a second late, he'd be a goner. Nor thinks Gilbert purposefully adjusted the speed of his attack, so Nor could barely dodge it. And he's grateful to Gilbert for showing him he still has a ton of training to do. The next day, Nor starts scrubbing the drains with the epic sword he got from the king. And damn he was stunned by how dope that sword performs. Later, he chilled up in the forest because his work at the construction site got put on hold after the whole Minotaur incident. He trying to figure out how to kill time till the job's back on track, and he's also trying to put that massive sword to good use. He thinking maybe it could be a sick paddle, or a pizza shovel, or even a grill plate. But he ain't got the resources to start those businesses. So he tries busting out his fire magic, but that shit is weak as hell for starting a barbecue. Then he hears footsteps creeping up behind him, and he turns around to see Lin standing there, looking for him on purpose. Nor asks how he can help her, and Lin asks to be his apprentice so she can learn from him while serving him. She all eager to do whatever he wants, but Nor shuts that down real quick. He tells her he can't teach her shit because he's self-sufficient in everything. Lin tries tempting him with cash for his training, but Nor makes it clear he doesn't want anything. She keeps pushing, saying she gonna be helpful to him, but Nor can't get through to her. So Lin decides to prove herself by showing off her magic powers. She summons icicle lances and shoots them at herself, 
then straight up burns them with some powerful fire spell. Next, she chops down a massive tree with a tiny dagger using some crazy skill, and then she busts out a magic sword move to blow up a tree behind Nor. She thinks Nor gonna accept her as his apprentice after that sick display, but he still ain't having it. He finally realizes Lin is giving him way too much credit, and he wonders how the hell he gonna make her understand that he ain't shit compared to her. Nor decides he gonna flex his skill and creates this tiny fireball to straight up prove to Lin that he is a loser. And damn Lin is hella shocked when she peeps it. She starts walking home with that in her head, thinking about the tale of the talentless boy all the teachers used to spit. Back in the day, Lin just thought it was a cautionary tale because she never believed any 12-year LD boy could handle the brutal training from all six schools for a full term. Even seasoned warriors had a hard time sticking around that long. But one day, the baddest magician who runs the magic school shows her his tiny fire skill, and then he straight up amps it up to show off his mastery. That magician tells her it takes decades of grind to make that tiny flame skill grow. That's why when Nor shows Lin his tiny fire today, she left speechless because that shit is way bigger than the baddest magician in the whole damn world. He tells her that's all he can pull off, and his skill in other areas is on the same level. Only Lin knows that the size of that small fire speaks volumes about Nor's ability, and she figures he a straight up master in the other branches too. Now she feeling hella ashamed because she was all proud of her high level skills she just learned. She realizes that even though Nor is way stronger than her, he never brags about his power. Dude even takes care of the most basic tasks to help others. She thinks Nor's mind and character are as strong as his body, and ain't nothing gonna faze him. As the princess, she gonna have to lead the kingdom alongside her brother one day, and she gotta be strong. She wants to learn how to be strong from Nor. So she reaches out again when he's coming out from a restaurant after eating. Lin tells him she fully gets how immature and vain she was, and now she is even more fired up to learn from him. She believes his strength gonna be the foundation for their kingdom's peace and prosperity. So she accepted him as her master. But Nor is hella troubled by it, and he just wanna leave and head home. The scene switches to Rain, wondering why his dad would hand over the black sword to some random dude. He breaks it down that back when his old man was out adventuring, he dove deep into the labyrinth of the lost with the big shots to snag that sword after years of risky moves. This blade is crafted from materials never seen before, tougher than Orichalcum and Mithril. Since no skill or trick could even make a scratch on it, it got the rep of being the indestructible blade. The real puzzler was how it ended up in such a beat up state. Rain figures it ain't something you just toss around casually. He figures his dad must have clocked the dark vibes creeping over the land. He figures the old man must have bet on that dude, thinking he might be the ace up their sleeve against whatever's rolling their way. Next up, we peep Nor grabbing a bite at a food stand, chilling with Lin. He checks if she's good being out here, and she's cool with it. Nor mentions he's thinking of hitting the guild after eating, and she agrees, calling him her master. Nor's thrown by this, feeling like he ain't worthy of that title. The more he tries to clear it up, the deeper the hole gets. While he is eating, he figures she should notice he's just regular when she checks out the odd jobs he's on. Cut to him at the guild, and the guild master is surprised to see him with Lin once more. On the low, he asks Nor what's the deal, and Nor says it's complicated. The guild master senses Nor might not be up for talking about it, so he skirts around the topic. But Nor says he needs to talk about this because even he's fuzzy on the situation. The guild master brushes it off, thinking Nor's here for a job, and Nor requests something for a duo. The guild master explains that since Lin's a B-ranked adventurer, they could take on a goblin hunt quest outside town if they team up. Nor's hyped to hear this, recalling that goblins are like training dummies for adventurers. He's shocked he can take on a job like that, feeling stoked but he wonders if it's cool to lean on Lin's rank like this. He feels it might be too selfish to ask her to roll with him, especially after telling her to bounce before, and he not even being sure if Lin would want to team up with a weakling like him. Lin asks if everything's cool, and Nor wonders if she's cool with him leaning on her rank. Lin's totally down with it, saying he can use whatever she's got. Nor still feels kinda guilty relying on a young girl like her, but he's hyped to finally chase one of his dreams, so he gears up to head out to find those goblins. The guild master reminds him that he didn't even spill where the goblins are at, so he swings back. The guild master green lights the mission for them, cautioning Nor to stay sharp, because goblins might be weak but they ain't no joke. Nor nods in agreement, and the guild master points them to the goblin spot. He tells them to tally their kills when they get back, and to bring back those right ears as proof or they ain't getting paid. Lin peeps that the goblins are chilling in the forest of beasts. The guild master mentions they've been scarce lately, so if they strike out, they can snag some herbs instead. They get it and head out for the quest. Next scene, they're at the city gates, get their papers checked by the guards, and get the green light to dip out of the city. Then they hit up the forest of the beasts, 
and nor clocks that this place is nothing like the south woods he's used to, he thinks even the trees are on steroids here, and Lin schools him that the whole ecosystem's different too. Nor asks her what's the deal with goblins, and she explains they mostly munch on fruits and critters, but they ain't afraid to throw hands at folks. If they ain't kept in check, they breed like crazy, and when they're hungry, they hit up human spots. That's why the capital sends adventurers to keep their numbers in check. But the forest's vibe clicks with goblins, so they can't just wipe them all out. She drops knowledge that this spot's got rare plants and critters, making it a hotspot for newbies to stack some cash. Nor gets it, and Lin's glad she aced the explanation, thinking he was testing her. Nor sees Lin's got smarts to match her strength, and he feels like he ain't got much to teach her. They push deeper into the forest, and some light fog surrounds them. Later on, Lin taps into her detection skill to scope out for goblins, but she's coming up empty, which is odd because they usually bump into some by now. She figures the word on the street about fewer goblins might be legit, then she senses something deeper in the woods. She suggests they investigate, and they push even further into the forest. The place gets darker with all the thick plants around. Lin schools Nor that this kind of terrain is where goblins thrive. Suddenly, she looks shocked, and Nor asks what's wrong. She reveals that whatever she sensed was right in front of them but now poof, it's gone. Nor thinks it might have been a sick monster that croaked on its own, which Lin agrees could be the case, but they decide to check it out anyway. They can't find anything on the ground, but Nor spots a goblin corpse floating in the air. Lin senses trouble and casts her uncover spell, and damn they uncover a massive hidden goblin emperor. Lin tries to ID the beast, but before she can, Nor jumps in thinking it's just a goblin, shocked at how much bigger it is than he expected. He can't wrap his head around how these are supposed to be the weakest monsters when this thing's staring him down with green skin, two legs, and a mean glare, just like goblins are known for. He can't believe adventurers treat this as small fries, noticing Lin shaking. He figures she's still green in the combat game despite her skills, so it's understandable. Lin though knows it's a goblin emperor, a subspecies of the goblin king, a top-tier monster. She explains these monsters are man-made, born from forbidden research, and this one can chow down on its own kind, sucking up their mana to level up. Nor's clueless about all this, telling Lin not to trip since it's just a goblin. She wonders if Nor saw this coming, and this is why he tagged along, so she recalls his odd reaction when goblins were mentioned. And then Nor suggests they take down this beast together, and Lin's all in, so they gear up for the showdown. The monster keeps coming at them with tree attacks, but Nor skillfully parries the strikes. It strikes again, but Nor deflects one of the trees with his parry. This gives Lin a chance to cast Wind Cutter and Icicle Dance spells, but the monster is too fast for her to land a hit, so Nor starts to question if goblins are naturally this fast. Next the goblin throws a tree at Lin, but Nor jumps in to save her by deflecting it away, then more trees come flying at him, but he manages to parry them as well. Lin notices the monster's wounds healing rapidly, surprised by the speed of the goblin emperor's recovery. Spotting a mana stone on its forehead, she realizes this is the source of its extraordinary healing. Lin instructs Nor to try and remove the stone, but the monster launches a barrage of trees at him. Unable to deflect them all, Lin steps in and uses her wind blast to send the trees back at the monster. Although the monster gets injured, it swiftly heals each time, confirming the mana stone's role in its healing. Nor understands they can't keep up like this and doubts they can take out the stone, even with Lin's abilities. With a bold idea in mind, Nor asks Lin to channel her wind blast at his back. Lin hesitates because the spell is powerful enough to blast through a castle wall, but Nor reassures her that she'll be targeting his sword not him directly, as their only chance to outpace the monster. Lin agrees and casts the wind blast on the sword, propelling Nor forward at top speed. The velocity is too much for him, so he combines physical enhancements with feather step. Pushing himself to the limit, he ends up breaking a bone but quickly mends it with low heal magic. Then he leaps and strikes the monster's forehead causing the crystal to pop out as he tumbles to the ground. The monster's in agony from the attack, and Lin checks on Nor, making sure he's good. He says that he is fine, and tells her to handle the rest. Nor suggests she puts the monster down easy, but she goes and uses Hell Flare, burning it alive not knowing that's a brutal way to go. And Nor's just as clueless for not catching on, so he says a prayer after taking the monster out in the worst way possible. He figures he's had enough goblin hunting for a minute, realizing he should stick to his usual gigs and not get too ahead of himself so he decides he needs to level up before taking on something like this again. Later on, Rain learns about the Goblin Emperor. He checks out the mana stone they got from the monster, seeing that a Goblin Emperor with a stone this size must have been massive. Turns out, it was way bigger than a Goblin King, and he thinks it might be linked to the Magic Empire. The mana stone turns out to be the demon's heart from the Holy Theocracy of Mitra, 
so he wonders how his sister's doing. The shadow company tells him she's only got minor scratches, and Rain's amazed they took it down with so few injuries. The shadow company mentions the monster was using a high-level concealment spell to hide. According to Lin, it must have been there for at least two to three days. Rain's worried even the shadow company missed the concealment spell and wonders how something that big got into their turf. He figures their sensors should have caught it if it was summoned and wonders if there were any warnings. He learns goblin activity has been dropping in the area and thinks it might be going down in other spots too. The shadow company gives him a report on weird incidents in the last three months, and he tells them to keep digging. Then we see Lin and Nor head back to the guildmaster to give their report. The guildmaster's shocked that Nor took down a goblin. Nor admits it was a tough fight, crediting Lin for their victory. But Lin insists Nor did the heavy lifting. Anyway, Nor feels it was a big day for him as he had his first hunt today. Listening in, the guildmaster assumes Nor was watching while Lin handled the action, thinking it was the right move given Nor's strength, and thinking it must be a good learning experience for him. Nor agrees, mentioning he didn't expect goblins to look like that. Nor points out the gem on the goblin's forehead was its weak spot, surprising the guildmaster. He's used to mana stones being in the heart or throat and starts wondering if what they faced was truly a goblin. Nor turns to Lin for confirmation, and she backs up her master's claim that it was indeed a goblin. The guildmaster speculates it might have been a rare goblin, pondering if they kept an ear as proof. Nor realizes they forgot about that detail, admitting they actually burned the damn creature. Soon after that, Rain gets reports of some weird stuff going down in nearby cities and villages. Folks are hearing strange noises at night, and animals are coming back from the forest all freaked out. In other places, pets are straight up disappearing, and the forests have gotten eerily quiet. Rain thinks this might be a sign that some unnatural monsters have snuck into their kingdom, so he immediately orders his men to send out search parties and get everyone with detection spells on the job. He also tells them to summon the six masters of each school because they might need their help. Once his crew is gone, Rain loses it a bit, tossing papers in the air and wondering if the Magic Empire really wants their dungeon so badly that they're willing to go to such lengths. Meanwhile, Nor and Lin are chilling, enjoying some street food with their reward money. The guild master ended up giving them cash for slaying a goblin even without proof, just because it was Nor's first mission. After they're done eating, Lin tells Nor she's heading home, and he's happy to finally get some peace. Just then, Rain shows up looking for his sister. When he sees Nor, he immediately asks him to visit a town in the mountains the next morning. He says Lin will join him and that he'll handle all the arrangements and pay him well. Rain doesn't spill the details about his business in that town, but Nor agrees because Rain seems legit. The next day, Nor hops into a carriage to their destination. It's his first time riding in a carriage, and it's the main reason he accepted Rain's quest, and he soaks in every moment. Meanwhile, Lin looks pretty down, and he asks if she's not digging the beautiful scenery outside. Nor's attention goes back to the view, and he starts dreaming about leaving the city to travel once he becomes a proper adventurer. Lin suddenly apologizes for her brother dragging him into this, but he tells her it's all good because he's getting paid, and this makes Lin even more bombed out. This morning, Rain had explained that their mission was to head to the town of Tauros on the other side of the mountain. If nothing went down after a while, they should move on to the neighboring country, the Holy Kingdom of Mitra. He told Nor that as long as nothing happened, he could treat it like a paid vacation. Lin is hoping nothing will really happen, so her bodyguard Inns reassures her, saying there is no need to worry because she is here to protect her. The truth was, Rain had given Inns a top secret mission before they left. He said their kingdom was facing a great danger soon, and if it fell, Inns should take Lin and seek shelter in Mitra. Inns was shocked and asked if Lin knew about this. Rain revealed that he hadn't told her because she would surely oppose it. He was really worried about Lin's safety and told Inns she was the only one he could trust with that. Back to the present, the group is taking a break, and Inns apologizes to Nor for dragging him into this. She promises to keep him safe, but he tells her there's no need because he's good at running away. Inns insists, saying there won't be any need to run because she has her shield with her. Nor says he can't see anything, so Inns decides to show off her abilities. She creates a holy shield with her special ability and tells Nor that if anything happens, he should hide behind it. He's impressed and remembers how Lin said Inns is on the same level as Gilbert, the spear user he fought. He's heard that Gilbert is strong enough to defeat a dragon, and if Inns is on that level, Nor thinks they're way too strong compared to someone like him who struggled fighting a mere goblin. He thanks Inns, saying she's really talented, but that reminds her of her childhood. She lived in an orphanage, and one day she accidentally activated her power. Then her friend got curious and tried to touch it, only to get her finger cut. 
The caretakers called the principal, and soon the magician master, the redhead warrior, and even the priest showed up at the orphanage. They asked Inns to show her abilities, and the magician declared that it was a gift from heaven, something only the rarest people could receive. He told the young Inns that her power could be a blade that could cut through anything or a shield that could block any attack, depending on how she used it. These heavy words weighed on Inns, but the redhead warrior told her he would train her to use her power correctly. He took her in as a student, and while Inns trained with him, she kept her distance from everyone in the orphanage out of fear of hurting them. That was until she met Nor and learned his name. She'd heard that name a lot from the redhead warrior, who was her master and adoptive father. One day, while hunting monsters in the forest, another warrior told the redhead warrior that a huge group of monsters was approaching. The redhead warrior was lost in thought and mumbled that he wished Nor was there at times like this. Inns was curious about the person her father acknowledged, but more than that, she was jealous. Ever since she met Nor, her jealousy had grown, and she wanted to shake off that feeling so she could protect Lin without any weakness. Just then, Nor noticed something moving through the wheat fields, leaving a strange trail. As soon as Lin heard this, she asked the carriage to stop. She used her magic to reveal whatever was hiding in the field, and it turned out to be a huge frogbat hybrid monster. Meanwhile, numerous monsters attacked the capital all at once. Rain commanded the warriors, swordsmen, and hunters to hunt as many as they could, while the thieves were to help the civilians evacuate. King Clays recalled the words of Emperor Derridas, who had told him they would regret not accepting his conditions. He believed that Derridas was behind this attack, and Rain agreed. He thought this might just be the beginning and that they should brace for much worse. Clays asks about the six masters, and Rain says they're all out dealing with powerful monsters. The redhead warrior and his crew are fighting three goblin emperors in the forest, the sword master is taking down lizard monsters in the city, and the hunters, magicians, healers, and thieves are all on the job too. And the king's worried they've spread them too thin. Meanwhile, just as Lin uncovers the concealment spell on the black dragon, it attacks the girl in front of him. Lin and Inns know this monster, it's the Black Death Dragon, which is super dangerous. Nor charges at it without hesitating to protect the girl. He parries the dragon strikes with his black blade, and Inns notices the girl showed up out of nowhere right when Lin broke the concealment spell around the dragon. Lin realizes the girl's gotta be a demon with monster controlling powers. Her brother once told her about demons who look like humans but are more like monsters. He said demons are a nasty bunch that wiped out a whole kingdom once, and humans hunted them down. So their descendants still hold deep grudges against humans, according to Rain. Back in the present, Inns is sure the girl's a demon who brought the dragon to the city. When Lin used her spell, it must have surprised the girl, and when her control over the dragon slipped for a second, it attacked her. Inns thinks they shouldn't save someone like her, but Nor rushed to help without a second thought. As she watches Nor still fighting the dragon, Inns wonders what he's thinking. Lin says they need to help Nor, but Inns stops her, saying it's too late for him. Nor thinks the dragon's slow and weak compared to the goblin he fought, and he believes if he just buys time, Lin will help him out. But suddenly, the dragon shoots its breath at him, and Nor decides to parry it because the girl will get hit if he dodges. But that was the worst move he could make as the attack explodes, releasing some super powerful poison in the air. Nor immediately starts vomiting black blood, and bloody tears start flowing from his eyes too. He realizes he just got hit by some seriously deadly poison, and it seems too late because he's starting to lose consciousness. He hits the ground, and Lin tries to reach him, but Inns blocks her way with a barrier, saying she'll only get herself killed if she goes near the Black Death Dragon. She creates a barrier by stacking her shields together, hoping to keep Lin safe till she can get away. Lin begs her to let her help Nor, but Inns refuses, saying her top priority is protecting the princess. Then the dragon suddenly launches another round of poison breath, and Inns immediately adds more shields to her barrier. She tells the princess to focus on surviving, but Lin still uses her purification magic, hoping to save Nor. Her magic ain't strong enough, and as the black poison covers everything, Inns apologizes to Nor, saying she couldn't save him. Suddenly, a part of the black dragon's claw hits her barrier, and the poison cloud disappears. Nor is still fighting the dragon despite being hella poisoned. Seeing him like this, Inns realizes why the redhead warrior wanted Nor's help in tough spots. She thinks he's the ultimate shield, always protecting people even if it costs his life, but she also thinks he ain't making it out alive. Meanwhile, Nor keeps parrying the dragon's attacks. He counters its poison breath too but leaves himself open. He blocks the attack, but that's all he can do before collapsing. He puts his hand to his face, sees the poison blood, and thinks he'll somehow manage things this time. Then we see a glimpse into the tragic backstory of the demon kin child. From the moment he and the other so-called cursed children were born, they were cast out by society, despised for their ability to control monsters. They were thrown into cells like animals, 
forced to eat food that barely passed for scraps. The power to control monsters had once been harmless, just a way to manage livestock. But then some genius decided to weaponize it, using it to control beasts in battle. From that point on, this power was feared and hated. In that hellhole of a prison, the boy endured daily beatings for no reason at all. Whenever he dared to ask what he'd done to deserve such cruelty, they'd beat him even harder, leaving him a battered mess, barely recognizable. As if that wasn't enough, they'd starve him for three days straight. After that, he quickly learned to keep his mouth shut if he wanted to avoid even more pain. But the torment didn't stop there. They paraded him like a freak show, putting him on display so the townspeople could spit on him, throw things, and hurl insults, treating him like he was the monster they feared. For most demon kin, this was bad enough. But for him, it was worse, because he could read minds. He could hear every vile, hateful thought they had about him all at once. And when people discovered his mind-reading ability, they despised him even more and their violence escalated. Despite all this, the idea of revenge never once crossed his mind. He hated his miserable existence, sure, but hurting others wasn't something he could stomach. Then one day, his captor gave him a twisted ultimatum, control two monsters and send them to attack a neighboring kingdom. In exchange, the daily beatings would be reduced to once a week, and he'd even get some bread that wasn't completely moldy. But if he refused, things would get even worse than they already were, hard to imagine, but possible. Desperate, the boy tried to read his captor's mind to figure out his true intentions, but the man wore a magical device that blocked his powers. With no other choice and fear gnawing at him, the boy agreed to the deal, determined to do whatever it took to survive and to protect the others like him. So he steeled himself, knowing he'd have to use those monsters to kill the people of the kingdom. But on the way, the barrier around him shattered, and he lost focus for just a second, but it was enough for the monster to break free. As he scrambles to regain control, the frog hits him hard, and that's when it hits him, he's really messed up this time. Because of his failure, the other demon kin are probably going to suffer a hell of a lot more than they did before. But as much as he feels bad for them, he's at least relieved that he gets to die without being forced to kill anyone. That was the one thing he never wanted, to cause pain to others. He just hopes that if he gets another shot at life, he won't be treated like trash again. Maybe, just maybe, he could even have a kind family and eat some good food for once. So he closes his eyes, ready to embrace whatever comes next. But before death could take him, nor steps in to defend him, the boy can't wrap his head around why someone from the kingdom would risk their life for him. And when the frog spits its poison, both Nor and the boy get a heavy dose of it. Nor had the option to use his basic healing magic on himself to neutralize the poison, but instead, he chooses to save the boy while he keeps on fighting. Soon enough, Nor collapses under the weight of all the poison in his system, but he's still got this unshakable confidence that he's going to pull through. That confidence comes from a memory of his childhood, after his mom had passed away, and he returned home. And one day, he ventured out into the forest to gather ingredients for dinner, and after a whole day of foraging, he had a bag full of herbs. He didn't really know what all the herbs were, but he figured, what's the worst that could happen if he just threw everything into a pot for dinner? Well, turns out, that was the worst idea ever. Nor found himself bleeding out on the floor because the soup he made was highly poisonous. With no one around to help, he was on the brink of death. Desperate, he used his low heal ability, hoping it would keep him alive just a bit longer. Thankfully, it did the trick, allowing him to survive until morning. Once he could finally stand, he headed outside to wash his face and then made his way to the library to figure out what the hell he had just eaten. Nor finally realizes the red herb he grabbed was called Dragon Ruin. His mom had even specifically warned him never to eat it, so now he's kicking himself for making such a boneheaded mistake. But being poisoned isn't going to slow him down. Nor fights through the pain, determined to keep up with his daily training, even as the poison wreaks havoc on his body. But it's too much, and he ends up collapsing to the ground. With what little strength he has left, he uses his low heal ability, and to his surprise, after blacking out, he wakes up feeling a whole lot better. His stomach ache is gone, which is great, but now he's ridiculously hungry. So he heads back into the forest to find something to eat, all the while being extra careful not to grab another dragon ruin plant. As he's inspecting a different plant, out of nowhere, a poison spike snake sinks its fangs right into his ass. Nor, not one to take this lightly, punches the snake to death. But these snakes are known for being extremely venomous, so Nor soon finds himself collapsing once again. Now, while anyone else would have been a goner by now, Nor wakes up a couple of hours later, perfectly fine. He can't believe he survived, and since he already killed the snake, he figures why not take it home and cook it up. His logic? If he survived the bite, eating it shouldn't be a problem. And this time, he's right the poison doesn't do a thing to him, and the snake actually turns out to be pretty damn tasty. 
The next day, Nor decides it's time to put his crazy theory to the test. He tracks down another poison spike and forces it to bite him, just to see what would happen. And just like he thought, the venom spreads through his body way slower than it did yesterday. Nor realizes he might have developed some kind of poison resistance. Excited, thinking this might unlock a new skill, Nor goes on a mission to eat anything poisonous he can find. Yeah, he ends up collapsing from a poison overdose more than a few times, but he just keeps getting back up and shoveling more into his mouth, no matter how much blood he coughs up. He never did gain any fancy poison-related skills, but he discovered something else, he actually likes the taste of poisonous things. So right now, even as a monster threatens his life, all he can think about is how damn good that frog's gonna taste after he kills it. The frog tries to flatten him, but Nor backflips out of the way and lands on his feet. The poison's pretty potent, so at first, it took his body a minute to fight it off, which is why he collapsed earlier. But now, he's totally immune to the frog's poison, so he jumps back into the fight. As the frog attacks, Nor systematically destroys all of its claws, and when it leaps at him, he smashes its face, shattering its teeth in the process. The frog, realizing it's in deep trouble, starts charging up a massive poison blast. Nor figures this must be its last-ditch effort to survive. But to Nor, it's just a free meal. So, before the frog can unleash its attack, Nor slams its mouth shut with his sword, causing all that poison to build up inside until the frog literally explodes. Nor is pretty pleased with himself for taking it down, but he can't help but wonder how a poisonous frog like that ended up in this field. Not that he's complaining, the more poison something has, the tastier it is for him. Then he remembers there's a kid behind him, so he turns around and asks if the boy is okay. The boy says he's fine, but Nor can tell the kid looks pretty rough, so he figures he'll have Lin heal him up properly once they're done here. Nor asks the boy what he's doing out here, and the kid, not wanting to lie, straight up tells him that he's the one who brought the frog here. He did it because he promised someone he'd get the frog into the city. Nor's brain starts working overtime, trying to make sense of what the boy just said. And because Nor's got this weird obsession with poisonous food, he immediately thinks of the black death dragon as just another piece of meat to eat. So he jumps to the conclusion that this kid must be a frog farmer. He even figures the boy was hiding in a barrier because he didn't want anyone stealing his precious, toxic frog meat. Now, Nor's convinced he's totally messed up this kid's meat delivery, so he starts apologizing like crazy. He even offers to pay the kid back for the frog meat, even if it takes him years. But the boy shakes it off, telling Nor it doesn't really matter to him. Nor accepts that, but he's still scratching his head, wondering how a young kid like this managed to drag a giant frog all the way here. Hesitantly, the boy admits he has the ability to control monsters, and that's how he got the job done. Nor is blown away, thinking the kid must have some insane skill, but the boy clarifies it's not a skill, it's something he was born with. He also drops the bomb that he's a demon kin. The boy expects Nor to freak out or get mad, but Nor just starts daydreaming about all the things he could do if he had that power. He's thinking about having animals help in the fields, sending messages with birds, and never worrying about monsters again. He even wishes he had the ability himself. The boy, surprised, asks Nor if he really isn't scared of him and his ability. Nor, being Nor, doesn't see why he should be. To him, the boy's ability is super useful. The kid is shocked to hear this and breaks down in tears because he never imagined his life could have any real purpose. Nor sees a lot of himself in the boy and can't understand why the kid has such low self-worth when he's got this awesome ability. So he figures there's more to the story but knows the boy has the potential to become someone great. So, Nor assures him that he's got a bright future ahead. Just then, the rest of the crew comes rushing over to check on Nor, and Lin is all set to start healing him right away. But Nor waves her off, saying he's totally fine and there's no need to fuss. Lin can hardly believe her ears, how could Nor be okay after taking a hit from the Black Death Dragon? That dragon's breath isn't just poisonous, it's pure concentrated miasma, the kind that could corrupt even the soil itself. It makes no sense that Nor could withstand it. There's only one explanation that comes to her mind. She remembers Saint Soin once teaching her about a technique called Sacred Spirit. This technique, which purifies and negates all forms of corruption, is something that Saint Soin took 40 years to master. Yet somehow, Nor seems to have achieved it without even realizing it, and in less than half the time. Nor, still unfazed, asks Lin if she can heal his new friend here, but the boy insists he's fine and doesn't need any healing. Lin takes one look at the boy and instantly recognizes him as Demon Kin, which puts her on edge. Nor however doesn't see the issue and suggests they let the boy join them in the carriage so they can give him a ride. Lin is skeptical everything she knows about demon kin says they're a dangerous race, and most places would have them killed on sight. So she questions Nor, asking if he's really okay with bringing the boy along, especially after he brought that monster and caused all this chaos. Nor acknowledges that it's a shame the field got wrecked, 
but he feels like he owes the kid since he ended up killing the poison frog the boy worked so hard to bring here. So Nor remembers the kid saying he promised someone he'd bring that frog here. But hold up, who the hell was this person? The boy shrugs, saying he's not sure because they never let him in on that info. And Inns can tell he's not bluffing. Plus, judging by the state of his body and the way he carries himself, Inns can tell this kid must have been a slave wherever he came from. Slavery might be banned in the Kingdom of Clays, but other countries? Not so much. Syed hits her that the boy was probably forced into this mess. She asks if he remembers the way back to where he came from, but the boy shakes his head, explaining that he was blindfolded before they dumped him in the middle of nowhere and told him to head in this direction. Lin starts to realize she might have jumped to the wrong conclusion about the kid, so she asks Inns if they can bring Rollo along on their journey. But there's a big ass problem with that plan, demon kin aren't allowed anywhere near Mitra, so trying to sneak Rollo in could make them look like enemies. Just as they're wrapping their heads around this dilemma, they hear a voice from behind. Turning around, they see a man standing there, looking all surprised, as if he expected Rollo to be dead already. The man notices that the cargo hasn't been delivered properly, and Nor asks if he was the one who ordered it. The assassin explains that he's just a hired hand, and then curiously asks if Nor was responsible for what happened to the dragon. Nor admits he was and even apologizes for it, so he's puzzled by Nor's apology for the dragon state, but he quickly brushes it off, stating that his only business is with the kid Nor has with him. He declares he's there to take the boy home, and Nor is relieved, thinking the assassin is there to pick up Rollo. The assassin however smirks and mentions that taking Rollo is going to make him a lot of money. So without a damn warning, he lunges at Rollo, but Nor swiftly parries the attack. Nor clearly confused, asks what he's doing. The assassin coldly replies that Nor is in his way and demands that he hand over the demon folk. Nor now realizing the gravity of the situation, questions if he's referring to Rollo, but the assassin doesn't care about names. He casually mentions that delivering Rollo's corpse would fetch him a high price, and Nor is taken aback by this revelation. The assassin relentlessly continues his assault, but Nor blocks every move. The assassin is frustrated and suggests that bringing Rollo in alive and letting his employer kill him would be an option, but it would be more troublesome. So he makes another attempt to strike Rollo, but Nor intervenes once again, parrying the blow. Lin is watching the intense high-paced battle, and can barely keep up with what's happening, so Inns tells her to stay behind her no matter what. Meanwhile, the assassin is starting to think that Nor is really strange, as he continues his unyielding attacks, but Nor skillfully keeps parrying each one. The assassin grows increasingly frustrated and thinks to himself that Nor is a serious pain in the ass, and decides it's time to take his head off. He charges at Nor with a full power attack, and while Nor manages to block it, the sheer force sends him flying. Somehow Nor manages to stop himself mid-flight, but he's baffled by how the assassin can deliver such devastating blows with knives so small. The power behind the strikes feels as intense as the hits from the cow he fought earlier. During the exchange, one of the assassin's knives breaks, so the assassin swiftly replaces it with another, and Nor is left parrying a relentless volley of attacks. He's barely managing to protect Rollo, relying solely on his instincts, but he knows it's only a matter of time before the assassin overpowers him. The assassin though surprised that Nor has lasted this long, continues his onslaught. Lin is watching from a distance and can feel the intensity of the battle even from far away, so Inns shields her with a barrier, urging her to step further back as the situation becomes increasingly dangerous. As she watches the battle, a realization hits her, there's only one man who dresses like this. She reveals to the others that the assassin is none other than Dead Man Zadu, a former S-ranked adventurer. Her thoughts flash back to when she once interrupted a meeting of the Six Sovereigns. Gilbert had asked her why she had abandoned her guard post, and she explained that she had come across something strange while on duty, an unresolved case that persisted even though the target was supposedly dead. Dandalg had told her to let it go, explaining that the target had been declared dead to the public, even though he was still alive. Sig had quickly understood that they were discussing Dead Man Zadu, the once celebrated adventurer, who after reaching the pinnacle of his career at a young age, had become an S-ranked target. Hearing this, Gilbert's interest was piqued. He wondered aloud if they wanted him to take care of this guy, but Sig quickly shut him down. Gilbert was surprised that this Zadu was strong enough to intimidate even the six sovereigns. Curious, he tried to dig deeper into who Zadu really was, but Inns quickly stopped him, while Mian warned that Zadu was far too dangerous. Karu chimed in, mentioning that there was no merit in hunting Zadu down right now. Seeing Gilbert's curiosity, Oaken explained that Zadu had mastered ancient dwarven alchemy and earned the title of Dragon Slayer at the mere age of 13. His skills and fame had continued to grow, spreading far and wide, reaching even the most distant lands. Zadu had climbed to the very pinnacle of the adventurer ranks, and Gilbert remarked that he sounded like a legend straight out of a fairy tale. 
Inns then questioned how someone like Zadu had ended up as an S-ranked target, so Sig explained that Zadu hadn't always used his talents for good, he stated that the information Inns had found should be detailed in the report. Upon reading it, Inns discovered that Zadu had killed 36 members of the Serenza Trading Company. Gilbert was shocked to learn that Zadu had murdered ordinary civilians. Sane added that because of this massacre, many within the guild wanted to revoke Zadu's adventurer license. However given his significant contributions such as single-handedly defeating disaster-class monsters, the guild couldn't come to a consensus. Sig then revealed that Zadu would take on any commission, no matter how grim, as long as it paid well. He didn't care about common sense, the history of nations, or the consequences of his actions. Sig explained that the most extreme example was when Zadu obliterated the entire military of a nation, treating them like mere goblins, and went on to massacre their royal family. This was the moment people realized that Zadu had no concept of right or wrong, leading to his designation as an S-rank target. Inns added that countless adventurers had challenged Zadu, lured by the enormous bounty on his head, but their efforts only resulted in piles of corpses and an ever-growing reward. The guild eventually declared him dead to prevent further casualties, which is why he's now known as Dead Man Zadu. Zadu then breaks another knife while battling Nor, and he's stunned that Nor has already demolished most of his prized collection. The ever-polite Nor apologizes and explains that it's only because Zada came at him first. Zadu waves it off not holding it against him. What puzzles Zadu is Nor's ability to break through mithril weapons, and even more so, Orichalcum and Dragon Tusk, which are not supposed to shatter. Nor still in the thick of the fight, wonders if Zadu expects compensation for the damage. Zadu is baffled by Nor's strange nature and even stranger sword, and decides that none of it matters, so he's determined to end this now. With that, he hurls the cross he's been carrying into the air, which splits into several silver crosses. Inns thinks that this is a deadly weapon capable of claiming hundreds of lives in a single strike, and Zada mentions that Nor can break as many of them as he likes, as he can always remake them. He attacks Rollo using them, and Nor parries them, but he can't parry them all so he uses his body to protect Rollo from them. He keeps doing this, and seeing this Inns thinks that he is not going to last long like this. She knows that she has to help him, but she hesitates to leave Lin's side. She thinks that her main duty here is to help Lin escape this country safely, and she tries to get her priorities straight. She knows that this is what she must do right now, but she still asks Lin for her permission to go and aid Nor, and Lin allows it. We then see Nor still trying his best to deflect the silver crosses, but his hands are full, and he can do nothing but protect Rollo using his body. However Inns comes to his rescue in time with her shield, and she also attacks Zadu with them, but he dodges. She thinks that her duty is to protect Lin at all costs, and this is why she can't let this man die. She apologizes to Nor for being late, and he thanks her for saving him. Inns launches another barrage of attacks with her shields, but Zadu manages to dodge every single one with alarming agility. Nor watches in awe as Inns uses her shields like swords, but he quickly notices that Zadu is slipping through her defenses. Inns sensing the stalemate, tells Nor that they need to change tactics. She decides to focus entirely on defense, asking Nor to take care of the offense. Nor is analyzing the situation and realizes that while Zadu's blades are fast, he's dealt with birds faster than them. He then spots the claws of the toad lying around and devises a plan, so he instructs Inns to lower part of her barrier on his signal, and she trusts him enough to comply. Nor channels his energy into his right arm, hurling the broken claws at the silver crosses just as Inns drops the barrier. The plan works, some of the crosses are destroyed, and Nor is relieved to see his strategy paying off. With plenty of ammunition left, he continues to take down more of the crosses using the same technique. As they make progress, Zada suddenly shifts his focus to Inns, launching a surprise attack. Nor reacts just in time, parrying the blow and saving Inns Zadu is taken aback, especially when he sees that his adamantite knife is shattered. He mutters about needing to recoup his losses and attacks Nor again, but Nor once again deflects him, asking Zadu to quit with the sneak attacks. Zadu is still perplexed and can't shake the feeling that there's something off about Nor's sword and about Nor himself. He wonders how Nor can even see and block his attacks, but Nor simply shrugs it off, saying he just manages. Realizing he's losing too many valuable weapons, Zada finally decides to call it quits. He mentions hearing about a grand festival in the capital but admits that after what happened here, he's no longer interested. Inns presses him for more details, but Zadu only knows that it's supposed to be something big. He then casually announces that he's heading home but not before pointing out how strange Nor really is. He mentions that he's met a lot of nut jobs in his time, but Nor is on a whole other level. With a parting shot, Zada tells Rollo to consider himself lucky for being spared today. Still, he can't resist one final surprise attack, but Nor blocks it effortlessly. With a smirk, Zada surrounds himself with black smoke, and just like that, he vanishes. Lin is recalling that Zadu mentioned something about a festival in the capital, 
and wonders if Nor is interested in checking it out. Nor considers it and decides they should head back. Rollo however looks terrified at the idea. So Nor notices this and reassures him that they won't take him to Mitra, but the capital should be safe enough. Rollo with a nervous tremor in his voice, tells them it's no use going to the capital. Nor is puzzled and asks what's wrong and whether there's an issue with taking him there. Rollo hesitates, then asks if they're from the capital. When Nor confirms they are and mentions that he was planning to drop Rollo off there, Rollo's fear deepens. Rollo warns them not to go to the capital, explaining that he's heard rumors of an impending disaster, something far worse than the Black Dragon of Death. He talks about a colossal monster that's supposed to appear, one that will bring destruction unlike anything they've seen before. Nor is taken aback and realizes the gravity of Rollo's fear. Lin clearly worried and insists they should head back to the capital immediately. Nor agrees, but Inns hesitates, refusing to escort her back. She reveals that Rain had specifically ordered her to take Lin away from the capital for her safety. Lin however isn't surprised, so she calmly explains that she understands her brother's intentions but running away won't solve anything. She stresses that they must return to the capital and report the imminent danger. Inns is still reluctant and tries to argue, but Lin reminds her of what happened to the demon folk when they lost their home, they were left with nothing, scattered and vulnerable. She warns that the same fate awaits them if they flee now. Seeing the determination in Lin's eyes, Inns finally relents. She agrees to return to the capital, but only on the condition that Lin stays by her side throughout the entire journey. Nor then turns to Rollo and asks what he wants to do, giving him the option to part ways if he doesn't wish to come with them. Rollo after a moment of hesitation, agrees to accompany them. He admits that while he may not be able to do much, his people are indeed the root of this trouble. Nor with a nod, acknowledges that the demon folk have a tough life. Lin observing Nor's expression, assumes he must be deeply troubled by the boy's background. But in reality, Nor is just sulking over missing out on tasting the poisonous toad. The scene shifts to the four of them making their way back to the capital. Lin feels a bit uncertain about the journey ahead, but she gains confidence knowing she's with the man who defeated the Black Dragon of Death and fought Dead Man Zadu to a draw. Her duty as a princess is not to flee but to ensure that this heroic figure, who seems to have leaped straight out of legend, reaches the capital safely even if it means sacrificing herself. She firmly orders Inns to go as fast as possible, and Inns complies without hesitation. The scene then cuts to the capital, where we find Rain walking through a town that has been reduced to ruins. Delcan approaches him, reporting that they've successfully evacuated most of the citizens from the old town to the square and that the six sovereigns helped repel the enemy's ambush. Rain is relieved but remains cautious, knowing that this isn't the end. Dalkan adds that the Shadow Company is thoroughly searching for any signs of the enemy but has found nothing. Rain however is certain that the enemy is biding their time, waiting for the perfect moment to strike again, likely aiming to exploit their weakened and scattered forces. He ponders which direction the next major attack will come from and even considers the possibility of an attack from the sky. Dalkan assures him that the Hunter Corps has confirmed no flying beasts are present, but Rain notices something strange, a distortion up in the clouds. He quickly uses his uncover spell to investigate and is horrified to discover that it's none other than the freaking legendary Dragon of Calamity. The story flashes back to Nor's childhood, where his father tells him about dragon slayers. He explains that a dragon who causes destruction is called an evil dragon, and an adventurer skilled enough to defeat such a beast earns the title of a dragon slayer. He adds that every part of a dragon, from its claws and fangs to its bones, is incredibly valuable, often used to craft weapons and medicine, bringing great wealth to those who harvest them. Nor with the wide-eyed wonder of a child, declares his desire to become a dragon slayer. His father with a mix of pride and caution, warns him that this path won't be easy, reminding him that some dragons have roamed the earth for over a thousand years causing the ground to quake with their every step and leveling mountains with just a flick of their tails. He recounts how long ago, this very continent nearly fell to a dragon's rampage, and he points out that someone as small as Nor would be devoured instantly. But despite the warning, Nor clings to his dream of one day becoming a dragon slayer. Fast forward to the present, Nor senses something ominous while traveling by carriage, though the others remain oblivious. So Nor points out the source, and Lin realizes it's the Dragon of Calamity. The scene shifts to the capital, where fear grips the citizens as the dragon soars overhead. Rain with a sinking feeling, wonders if the Empire even understands the catastrophic force they've unleashed. Dalkan speculates that the dragon should still be in its dormant state since it's only been 150 years since it last awoke. However, Rain grimly realizes that Mitra has disturbed its slumber, unleashing this ancient terror for the sake of human conflict. As the dragon's roar echoes through the city, Rain commands Dalkan to ensure that everyone at the evacuation site is moved outside the city immediately, 
insisting that no one is allowed to stay behind, even if they cling desperately to their belongings. As the evacuation begins, Mian observes the chaos. She notes that the six sovereigns, the kingdom's mightiest warriors, are scattered and that all the evacuation routes are blocked. Despair creeps in as she considers how dire the situation has become. Meanwhile, the six sovereigns are locked in battle with monsters, both within the city and on its outskirts, unable to turn their attention to the dragon. The king watches the dragon's approach from his castle, and Gilbert urges him to retreat to safety. But the king steadfast in his duty, refuses to abandon his people, instead asking Gilbert to lead the evacuation efforts. Meanwhile, Inn stares at the dragon through her binoculars, already dreading the destruction that's about to unfold now that the beast is here. She comments that the evacuation should be in full swing by now, while Lin deep in thought, realizes her father will likely stay behind. She knows painfully well, that he doesn't stand a chance against such a monster, and silently she wishes he'd just run for it. Nor then looks curiously at the dragon, and he is so excited that he finally lays eyes on a dragon. Rollo finds this downright bizarre, especially since Nor just squared off with the black dragon of death. But Nor's mind is elsewhere, thinking of Lin's father and brother, who are likely still in the city. When he brings this up, Lin confirms it but insists it's too late to save them. Nor however is having none of it, and he confidently declares that he can rescue them if he moves fast enough. Lin is taken aback, but Nor reminds her of the tactic they used against the goblin. The realization hits Lin like a ton of bricks, he's talking about using her wind blast spell. Though she's hesitant, knowing how powerful and unpredictable it can be, Nor reassures her. He says that his sword can handle anything, and he feels an obligation to repay the city that's given him so much by doing whatever he can to help. He believes that if it's just about getting her family out, they might just have a shot, and this sparks a flicker of hope in Lin. She can't believe she was ready to give up without even trying, and she knows that Windblast wasn't designed for this, but she knows her master doesn't exactly follow the rulebook, so she casts aside her doubts and decides to agree to his plan. Meanwhile in the capital, the king recalls the time Derrida's boasted that he could easily wipe out the king's tiny nation if he wanted to. Yet even with this threat looming over him, the king refused to hand over the dungeon of the lost. Derridas had scoffed at him, claiming the king was wasting the power that had been offered and bragging that with his country's wisdom, he could turn it into something capable of ruling the entire world. The king however retorted that true wisdom would have warned him not to meddle with powers beyond his understanding, so the enraged Derridas tells him that if the king was so cowardly, he doesn't deserve the crown at all. Reflecting on this, the king realizes that to Derridas, nothing mattered as long as he could get his hands on the dungeon of the lost. The king admits that he underestimated Derridas, never imagining he would go to such extremes to achieve his ambitions. As he stands atop the castle, his thoughts drift to his daughter hoping she is safe. He chastises himself for thinking of her at a time like this, admitting that Derrida's was right, maybe he doesn't deserve the crown. He mutters that perhaps a sword would suit him better, and with a heavy heart, he apologizes to his citizens for leading them on a fool's errand. Although he knows he can't atone for his mistakes, he resolves to at least take one of the dragon's eyes. Outside the capital, Ines creates a cylindrical shield and asks Nor to position himself in front of it. As Nor takes his place, he notices that something feels different this time. Lin then layers seven spells on top of the barrier to amplify its power, and seeing that, Nor isn't so sure about doing this now. Lin oblivious to his hesitation, tells him to brace himself because this impact is going to be even stronger than the last one. And with that, she casts her wind blast spell. After that shit, Nor is nowhere to be seen, and Rollo isn't sure if Nor could have survived something like that. Meanwhile, the dragon approaches the king, ready to unleash its deadly breath. As the prince watches, he realizes that this is the same devastating move that once raised an entire continent, and the king knows he won't even manage to take a single eye from the beast. Accepting his fate, the king grips his dagger, hoping to at least show the dragon what human resilience is made of. The seven sovereigns notice that the king is holding the blasting sword, pouring every last drop of his mana and his life force into one final desperate attack. But just before the king can strike, Nor suddenly reappears, parrying the dragon's face and diverting its deadly breath. The onlookers are stunned as the dragon crashes to the ground. The mighty beast now covered in dirt, finds Nor standing defiantly before it. The dragon can't believe that a mere human has dared to stand in its way, and it starts declaring that the world is ruled by the strong preying on the weak, and it's outraged that Nor would dare to defy this natural order. So it roars determined that it won't let this pass. The dragon then lashes out with its tail, but Nor effortlessly parries the attack, 
sending the dragon tumbling once more. Nor realizes he narrowly escaped death and recalls how Lin's spell had knocked him out for a second. When his sword crashed into something, it jolted him back to consciousness, and with him drawing on his physical enhancement, he ran allowing the wind blast to carry him forward. He couldn't stop even when he reached the city wall, so he had no choice but to leap over it. The boost from Lin's spell sent him soaring farther than expected, putting him on a collision course with the dragon. Thinking quickly, he parried the dragon's breath attack, saving himself in the nick of time. Back in the present, Nor is just relieved to have survived, and he takes a moment to heal himself, all the while thinking he'll need to have a serious talk with Lin about not doing that ever again. He notices that the dragon's breath, which seemed so terrifying at first, was surprisingly easy to brush off. The creature's massive size no longer intimidates him, and after enduring the shock of Lin's magic, he finds that fear is no longer in his vocabulary. As the dragon gets back on its feet, Nor begins to think that, in his current state, he might actually stand a chance against it. Meanwhile, Lin and the others have finally arrived in town. Ince quickly informs Lin that they need to grab the king and get out of there while Nor is keeping the dragon busy. But before they can move, Rollo warns them to watch out for some incoming rubble. Ince barely manages to protect them, but they end up falling from their horses. Keeping her barrier up, Ince instructs Lin to stay behind her, and that's when Lin spots three goblin emperors right in front of them. She notices that these are smaller than the one she and Nor faced together, but she knows they're still formidable foes, so she wonders how she should approach this battle and starts thinking about what Nor would do in this situation. With newfound resolve, she tells Inz there's no need to fear, after all, they're just goblins. Inz agrees, especially since compared to the Dragon of Calamity, these goblins are nothing. So they stay calm and prepare to face the goblin emperors. The monsters charge with clear intent to attack, but Lin quickly fires off some ice lances. Unfortunately the attack does nothing, and just as the goblins are about to strike, Rollo commands them to stop at the last possible second, and this gives Lin the perfect opening to cast a spell, freezing the goblins in their tracks. Inz then shapes her shield into a divine sword and uses it to slice through the frozen monsters in one swift motion. Watching this, Lin is in awe Inz really does live up to the title of the divine sword. She's also surprised that Rollo was able to stop those monsters with just a single command. It's hard for her to believe that the demon folk possess such power and seeing the young boy muster all his courage inspires her to give it her all as well. Meanwhile, Nor keeps parrying the dragon's attacks, and the dragon is getting seriously annoyed. We notice that Nor's parries are actually damaging the dragon's claws and scales, which is a big shocker to the dragon since they're supposed to be indestructible. Nor is just as surprised to see that his sword isn't even chipping, no matter how hard he swings it, and he wonders what kind of magical weapon this is. But then he decides it doesn't matter, as long as he has the sword, he can win. The dragon sensing a true challenge, finally accepts Nor as a worthy foe and takes to the air. Charging up a devastating breath attack, the dragon unleashes its fury, but Nor deflects the attack like it's no big deal, leaving everyone including the dragon completely astonished. The dragon roars in frustration, and Rollo explains that it's angry because it has acknowledged Nor as a legitimate threat, but Nor hasn't given it the same respect in return. The king notes that dragons are incredibly prideful creatures, and the dragon of calamity, which once had absolute confidence in its power, is now beginning to waver. The dragon realizes that it might have been the weak one all along, and it launches one final, desperate attack on Nor. But Nor parries again, and this time he manages to slice off one of the dragon's claws. The dragon finally humbled, bows down to Nor, calming its rage. Rollo sees this and mentions that the dragon's bow is a stance of submission, but Nor still confused, wonders what's happening. He notices the dragon's severed claw lying beside him and remembers his father's words about how valuable dragon parts are and how they can be used to craft weapons and medicine, bringing wealth to the land. He also recalls that those who can slay an evil dragon are called dragon slayers, but as he looks into the dragon's submissive eyes, Nor realizes that he's not cut out to be a hero. He lowers his weapon, sits down, and admits that being a hero isn't for him. Rollo then notices that the dragon no longer wants to fight, and Lin and the others approach Nor, taking in the scene with a mix of relief and awe. If you like the video, don't forget to like and subscribe to let the world know about our love for anime.